Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, we're going to be talking about stress, mental health and performance, and we're going to be doing that with Dr. Paul Mansell and Dr. Katie Sparks. Paul and Katie, welcome. Hi Dan, thanks very much for having us. Thank you. It's great to have you both on. Really looking forward to uh, unpacking a research paper that you've uh, recently done. Uh, Before we do that, let's uh, do some introductions. Katie, let's come to you first. Tell us a, a little bit about yourself and, and, and tell us about your work. Um, so, yeah, I'm Dr. Katie Sparks. I work at Staffordshire University as a lecturer in sport and exercise psychology. Uh, only been there a year, so I'd say I'm still the new girl, um, but quickly learning the ropes. Um, I did a PhD at University of Birmingham, and I think what inspired me to do that was I used to be a rower. I won't say I still row now. Okay. Um, and I kept choking under pressure, so I kept mucking up, basically. And I wanted to figure out why that was happening. So I did that, basically, um, through this theory of reinvestment, seeing where why I was overthinking my movements too much, basically. Um, and I was. So then I was like, okay, great, I've got the problem, but I want to try and fix it. So I then went and delved into mindfulness. I became a mindfulness practitioner. Um, I wanted to enter that into the world of sport, did that for a bit. And then quickly got a role with actually with British Rowing as a performance lifestyle advisor. And I occasionally run psych educational workshops for the under 19s, uh, ones on the talent pathway. So the younger athletes. Um, And then very quickly went to another university and then went over to staffs where Paul wondered if I would like to collaborate on this paper and on this intervention. Um, and I want to put up my two pennants worth in. So I threw self-compassion in there um, as well as his REBT and stress mindset stuff. So, yeah, I think that's me in a nutshell. And uh, just dwelling briefly on your rowing career, you said you still row now? No, not not as no, much. Maybe no. get on the erg a couple of times and okay. you know, at the gym and show okay. everyone else up. But that's about it. And, and did your studies uh, into your, or utilizing reinvestment theory, which we've spoken about on the podcast before, did your studies actually help you at that time to uh, deal with your choking under pressure? It's a horrible term, choking under pressure, isn't it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose I figured out that um, I was being too consciously aware of my movements, possibly. Right. Um, and this is after crabbing. I don't know if you know what crabbing is. But it's when you all get stuck in the water and you end up all being forced against you. Um, and it's a bit of a shock for rowers when that happens. It's normally when you're over tensing and you're overly conscious of your movements. So, but I actually became more conscious of my movements and realized that this kind of needed to let go. So I suppose that's where mindfulness came, came in. Although that's a conscious awareness, it kind of down regulates it slightly it turns it down if that if you know what I mean it turns the consciousness down slightly and keeps you in the present rather than dwelling on the mistake that you've made basically so yeah it did help and and so how did that I'm just eager to 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 talk about this just very very briefly you engaged in mindfulness yeah that helped you to stay more present yeah did you have many any kind of mini attentional cues in the boat um, or did you just, was it just a case of I'm going to clear my mind or I'm just going to focus on my breathing as I'm engaging in, in my, my rowing technique? How did it actually work at the coalface for you actually in the boat? Okay, probably in kind of two ways really. Um, yeah. I would be bad to say that it was just cue specific because that would be really against mindfulness itself. Uh, with mindfulness it's kind of when you cultivate it you cultivate it in all areas um yes. and, you know and it really does take a practice to it rather than being just another attentional regulation strategy um so i think through the through kind of the practice of meditation going out for mindful walks running being a bit more in tune with my rowing as well definitely helped so actually you kind of write with the attentional cues so those those things do help so like focusing on your breath or focusing on that sensation of putting the blade in and pushing away and what that feels like within your muscles or like the change in sensation in your feet as you push away there's a change there as you come forward and push back those kind of help me lock 
back into the to the present moment but I'd like to say there's much more to mindfulness than just being in, in the present moment there's all that non-judgmental awareness and that there is that element of self-compassion and that's compassion for you and compassion to others it kind of brings a whole host of things together yeah and, and what really stood out to me there was this idea of that, that kind of external focus mm. of attention uh, when when there was a focus of attention on on technique if you like or the the uh, result of technique which is you know pushing the oar yeah. away or your feet uh, a focus on your feet I, I think that's really really fascinating so Katie it's it's fantastic to to have you on and, and and coming to you Dr Paul Mansell great to see you and great to have you on as well tell us a little bit about yourself Paul and, and tell us about your work yeah, thank you, Dan. Long time listener to the show. Recommended many of your episodes to our students. A fan. My one fan. Brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs> so um, I've always been interested in sports since I was a little boy growing up near Wolverhampton in the West Midlands in the UK. But I started my undergraduate degree not really knowing what exactly I wanted to do in sport. That's going back a few years now. I won't say how many. Um <laughs> But I ended up being a PE teacher for, for about 10 years or so. But as I, as I went through my teaching career, what really started to grab my attention or where my passion really lay was teaching the sports psychology element of the, of the A-level course. So to take that further, I went on to do my master's at Staffordshire University um, as a distance learner, still working as well at the same time. Um, following that, I did a PhD um, on stress in sport at the same time as Katie, really, at the University of Birmingham. And even though we were there at the same time, our paths never properly crossed because of COVID. So it was a hugely COVID-affected PhD. But, um, yeah, I came across things like stress mindset, challenge and threat, um, REBT, which I'm sure we'll be delving into later on, and once, once I completed my PhD, I then um, got the job at Staffordshire University, so lecturer of sport and exercise psychology. Um, I've been there for about 18 months or so now. I love my job. I love the teaching element, um, which is mainly online, uh, our teaching at Staffs. Um, I guess you could say we, we were pioneers, really, in sports psychology distance learning. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say that. Uh, But we're really enjoying some of our work with the local schools, local sports clubs that we do. Been very excited recently to develop some partnerships in Portugal. Um, So, yeah, really enjoying my job and looking forward to talking about our recent research today. Uh, I heard you mention that you're from Wolverhampton. Are you uh, a football soccer fan? And if so, is Wolves your team? (laughs) Yeah, people might have detected that from my accent, but I am indeed. I've had it. I've had a season ticket for over 30 years. Oh, really? Um, I've got an away season ticket. Um, my daughter's come with me to the home matches. So, yes, absolutely, it's my passion. I also follow Wolves women as well. So if you want to find where I am at the weekend, you'd probably find me at a Wolves men's or women's football match. I was working with a, a team several years ago and uh, attending match days, game days with the team. And one of the stadiums we played in was Wolves. And this was back when Wolves were in the championship, not in the Premier League. So before the big takeover and, and, and the big campaigns to, to do one in the Premier League. And um, it's a great stadium, great team, great fans, Harsh fans at times. Uh, I, the team I was working with went 2 0 up, Paul, very, very quickly. And the fans turned pretty quickly on the Wolves team. So it's, uh, yeah, that day I was thinking about the psychology of the Wolves players and, and, and dealing with the pressure of um, some, some barracking from the, uh, from the supporters. Yeah, we've had a, a fair share of ups and downs, um, certainly when I, when I was younger, but. For the most part, over the last six, seven years, it's been an upward trend and really believe there's a strong connection between the club, the city, the fans. So, yeah, it's all good at the moment. It's a great club, uh, you know, and, and talking about competing in the Premier League and competing at the very highest level of sport. A big part of being able to do that is to be able to perform under pressure, to be able to deal with stress, to manage mental health. 
Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today because uh, you've both written a paper, Mindset Performing Under Pressure. There's a little bit more to that title, but that's the main gist of the paper. And you've uh, written this with a number of other researchers, Jason Wright, Leanne Rowe, uh, Shane Carrington, James Locke, and Dr. Matt Slater. Matt's been on the Sports Site Show before, so it was a real team effort. And, and, and coming to you, Paul, you led on this. I mean, is this a standalone paper on performing under pressure? Or was this paper part of a series of uh, research projects? Yeah, I mean, I think you make a great point there about about it being a collaborative effort. That isn't just the the delivery of the intervention, the physical delivery. Um, okay. We we devised it as a team, and I certainly don't want to. I know that I'm the lead author on this paper, but it's very much been a been a team effort and been very grateful to the input of everybody else. So, yeah, it's not a standalone paper. That's the the short answer. Um, We believe the principles of performing under pressure are very generalizable. So we initially wanted to work with students with my teaching background, um, Katie's lecturing background as well. We see day to day that students can be held back sometimes by the pressure that they put under themselves, potentially. But also we recognize that the, the core principles of our intervention could serve athletes. Um, and also, we're just moving across now into working with people in different occupational domains. So, Katie's, um, I've chosen to write up the athlete data. We've delivered the same intervention with students. So, that's about to go under review. So, there'll be a, a paper that Katie's led on soon. But we're also looking to deliver this work on a one to one basis. All this work that we're going to talk about today has been delivered at group level. But I'm very interested to understand if it's more impactful when we work with with athletes or students on a one to one basis. So look out for some more publications in the in the forthcoming months on that. So just staying with you here, Paul, for a second, uh, what was what were the objectives of the paper? So the, the paper was uh, entitled Mindset Performing Under Pressure. Um, you've used this term intervention quite a bit. T- t- tell me a little bit about the objectives. What were you trying to find out here? What were you actually studying? Very broadly, could we enhance the well-being and the performance of, of young people or young athletes in their, in their quest to do well? whichever situation they were in the paper um just to reiterate that was with with athletes so we we worked with some academy footballers some regional level swimmers so there's a fair amount of demands on themselves and maybe from their coach maybe from their parents to perform well how we wanted to do that essentially is to change their some of their core beliefs so we'll perhaps go into more detail in each one in a moment but we wanted to change their beliefs about the nature of stress. We wanted to examine some of their beliefs about um, difficulties, about failure. So their irrational beliefs, maybe, which, again, we can go into in more detail. And how we wanted to do that is a six, a six session. Each session was about an hour long, um, usually one week apart. And I guess... I don't know if it was me being indecisive or being spoilt for choice, but I think a strength maybe of the work is that there was a lot of variation in the content. So we didn't just focus on stress for six weeks. We didn't just focus on irrational beliefs for six weeks. I saw I saw strengths and I was interested in perhaps four or five different topics. And I thought by introducing athletes to those, and looking to teach them how to use them for their own benefit, I thought overall that could lead to um, enhancements in wellbeing and performance. And coming to you, Katie, what was uh, your involvement here? So I came up with that we possibly could incorporate self-compassion. I think there was a lot of discussion around whether REBT and self-compassion could be a good fit or not because ultimately they work they work very well separately as well you know you could have a whole intervention on self comp- self compassion you could have a whole intervention just rebt but there seemed to be this call out especially within the literature around like a lot of the time we stick to these single therapeutic approaches and like that's kind of been done to death like as i just said we know that they work but the problem was that they're not always 
that long lasting so sometimes they just kind of work for the time that the intervention is on for um whereas I suppose I quite like the idea that we were going to try and change a mindset and I always believe how we do that if you think about if you think about people in front of you people have different like people like different things I like to pick and mix so why run a single therapeutic approach in the hope to change a mindset when actually let's double that therapeutic approach and maybe we'll hit something um so that's when I was like I was like Paul let's try self-compassion um it was probably at that point actually not an area I'd fully gone into but it was it's very um much related to mindfulness like I said at the beginning and I felt with self-compassion from reading a literature as well and I knew that we were going into adolescence that especially female female adolescents tend to be really self-critical and so as being a woman myself like I can be very self-critical um and also with the adolescents you know in terms of their um brain development as well um one of the areas in their brain that they very much haven't got that rational head on them yet they're very self-critical and all that thing about human having humans having this negative bias so I just felt like we needed something in there to kind of kind of soften that and reduce it or give them I suppose not force them to reduce it but oh look there's another way of thinking or you could you could use this strategy instead that might be helpful um so that's kind of where where self-compassion came in so I'm going to reflect back what I'm hearing here for young athletes who are serious about their sports performing under pressure a sense of pressure might be there all the time yeah and as sports psychologists you were both interested and your team of researchers were interested in using an intervention now we're using this term intervention um uh, we might also consider the term coaching as well you're trying to coach people young young people young players young performers young participants to be able to change their change their experiences of stress in order to enhance their well-being and also potentially their performance am i am i hearing you correctly there have i missed anything out to either of you I think you're spot on there, Dan. Um, we stress, pressure, uh, whichever kind of phrase you want to use, that is never going to go away for anybody in any walk of life. And particularly if you're a young uh, athlete and you're trying to combine school, studying, um, performing well, sometimes that pressure can be magnified. So I think it's a futile task, really, to try and pretend it doesn't exist or to try and take it away. And yes, I agree, you know, at times, there are stresses that you can minimize that are unnecessary, but to perform well, that 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 demand, you actually should want that because it's important. You've signed up to be an athlete. You know, you probably like the competitive side of things. You want to perform well. So I guess our um, golden thread through all of the sessions really is that we're not trying to take stress away we're not telling you just to chill out. We're not trying to tell you to relax. Although, again, at times, there might be a place for that uh, when working with students and athletes. But we were trying to get them to utilise stress, essentially. That's what I'd say, perhaps in one sentence. Could we could we encourage the young athletes to utilise stress? This feels very important because, as as you're mentioning there, stress, the experience of stress is relevant for absolutely everybody especially if you're engaged in sports uh, and you're serious about your engagement in sport now i know that there's a relationship between the experience of stress and somebody's mental health uh, mental well-being uh, could either of you speak to the relationship between stress and mental health i suppose we all had this and i had this idea before like stress is bad stress is something that I need to run away from I need to try and reduce I suppose that's where sometimes mindfulness might have come in so you know it was something that I didn't always think was going to be helpful yep. um, and that's you know a lot of that is thanks to the to the media um, and to what we to, to kind of the headlines that we see stress is bad stress is going to harm you um, and yes chronic stress is bad and if and, and we always tell our our adolescents, whether students or or athletes, that actually 
continually having this chronic stress will be bad but acute levels of stress and being able to utilize that in the right way can actually be good and you can harness it for for your performance due to the fact that our like the physiology of our body which I really like this really sat with me when I first heard about it was actually like our body will respond to stress in quite a helpful way in the fact that it increases our blood flow with our heart rate increasing our breathing rate will increase so there's more oxygen going to the brain going to our muscles you know you can't argue against that 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 isn't good for performance you know back from my, well, my a level pe i know that's good for for performance and that's going to be helpful um but yes there's still that side of having a balanced view of it of you know if we have, do have too much stress again and again then yes okay and, and research will show you that can be damaging but i think we just need to get away from this all stress is bad that makes complete sense. Paul, anything to add on Katie's answer? Yeah, Katie's given a great answer there. And just to add, I suppose, to that, that stress is obviously used interchangeably with distress. Okay. And, you know, I mean, not wishing to single out any particular academics or, or anything, but on occasions you see academic definitions of stress and that's associated with not being able to cope okay. or... I think it's even mentioned sometimes that it's detrimental to mental health. But I would argue that if you've got a football match tomorrow and it's against a team of a similar ability, perhaps, to you, that is a stressful situation. But does it mean that you can't cope? No. Is it going to be necessarily bad for your well-being? No. So I think it's been unfairly labelled. And maybe that gives us, you know, something to work with because most people do think that stress is an only negative thing. That's what we found in our research. So that gives us a real good starting point, actually, because like Katie said, when you consider some of the physiological um, responses to a stressful situation, most of those are actually designed to facilitate dealing with that situation. Mm. And I think if I was if I was a coach working with, with young people, and I could see my athletes were feeling a bit anxious before the match, I'd be reminding them about adrenaline, for instance. You're probably experiencing adrenaline as you're walking out of that tunnel. But when you think about the purpose of adrenaline, it's designed to help um, with your focus. It can give you kind of a greater motivation to play well. And when you think of it like that, it can really free you up from being tied to this stress is only bad narrative. So how we see stress, how we describe stress, influences our experience of stress and subsequently mediates our performance, our well-being, our welfare, our mental health. And listening to to both of you, and I know, Katie, you'll speak to self-compassion in a few minutes, but perhaps coming to you first Paul because you're talking about seeing stress in a different light is really your first mm-hmm. port of call potentially potentially when it comes to um, dealing with your experiences of, of, of stress at the heart of all of this lies beliefs so in this project in this in this research project I assume you and your colleagues were trying to influence the beliefs that these young players had around stress, in essence, tackling irrational beliefs. Yeah, exactly. And it's important that we make that distinction here, that we were trying to change athletes' general trait-level beliefs about the nature of stress. As we've already highlighted, most people that stress think stress has only uh, debilitating Uh, effects on health, performance, productivity, growth, learning. Our argument is, and I suppose this is where this aligns slightly to REBT, is that that's not true. It's not true to think that, and neither is it helpful for you to think that. So if you've got these stress is bad goggles on, everything that you look at, so subsequent situations, individual situations, they're going to taint the way that you look at that situation So if we can change those goggles, change that mindset to being, like Katie said earlier, not all stress is good, 
not go and get as much stress as you can, but seeing it in a balanced way that can really help you when it comes to these individual situations. And I'll just close this little section by, um, again, trying to give some practical advice. You know, if you're a coach, teacher, sports psych, I try to use the phrase that stress is more good than bad. I think that's, I think that's fair. I think that's balanced. Um, I think it's probably 60 to 70% of the way along a continuum from 0% good to 100% good. So we're not trying to get people to like 90% or 100. That's not, again, that's not truthful. That's not fair. That's not helpful. But I think if you have this mindset that it's more good than bad, then that can do you much more, um, that can be much more beneficial than it is detrimental. So less about walking towards stress and more about reappraising the usefulness of stress. Yeah, being able to appreciate its its utility, being able to appreciate. And I think to give a specific example here, um, we were finding with, with the athletes that they can really buy into the idea that even when they've had difficult, stressful experiences in the past, and they might not have enjoyed that, and it might not have turned out well, we, we've been using the phrase, that's a deposit in your stress piggy bank. So the next time that you come up against a stressful situation, you're able to withdraw those deposits and it can build your character and it can make you stronger. And um, again, another practical example, um, thinking about David Beckham and the Netflix documentary, um, when he got that red card against Argentina at World Cup 98, that was easily the lowest point of his career. The abuse that he received was, you know, disgraceful, really. What happened to him in the next 12 months? He came second in the Ballon d'Or and he won the treble with Man United. So we say to the young athletes that we've been working with, at the time, that was a really difficult experience for him. He would have not enjoyed it. It would have been really uh, difficult for his performance and well-being. Would he have become the player that he was after that without that adversity so we, we talk about that being a you know really big deposit in his stress piggy bank that he was able to tap into and use over the course of the next 12 months and the rest of his career and you've already mentioned the acronym of rebt rational motive behavior therapy and we're going to come back to you in a, a second poll and uh, discuss that um but coming over to you, Katie, another strategy to potentially use to manage stress is utilizing self-compassion. Can you, can you introduce self-compassion? We, we have spoken about it a few times on the Sports Site Show before, but can you familiarize us with self-compassion and, and how it can potentially uh, facilitate helpful beliefs around stress? Mm-hmm. So... Self-compassion is kind of made up of these three pillars okay. that we like to say. So it's made up of self-kindness, common humanity, which is my favourite, which I'll come on to in a minute, and mindfulness. Now, I think they follow a co- kind of an order really here. I suppose this is why it links well with REBT. The first thing when you're trying to deal with something is that you have to have this element of self-awareness. That's mindfulness, a little bit of it, but that is mindfulness. So that element of self-awareness. Without self-awareness, you can't really change anything or you can't really move things along, or you can't really adapt anything about really being aware of how you think and feel in certain moments. Otherwise, you're on this autopilot, which is good sometimes, but not all the time. And then it goes on to this common humanity. So common humanity is a thing of, actually, I'm not the only person feeling like this. Like There's probably other people feeling exactly the same as me. So in our intervention, which is one of my favourites, obviously, we have this fear war. So what the players do we ask them to tell us well to write down some of their challenging thoughts before and after a failure because if you think about it a lot of stress comes from that thing of oh I might fail you know that that's scared that scaredness around failure and how am I going to beat myself up and all that so we get them to write these down then we get them to just identify one which is their most damaging thought and then they go and put it up on the wall and I suppose it allows people to see actually they're all quite similar in that thought or what they're scared of or, or what they're fearing or the thing that's damaging them. That in itself, sometimes with people can be enough to be like, 
oh, I'm not isolated here in this feeling. There's other people that feel the same. And it kind of brings back that thing of, as humans, we are fallible. We will make mistakes where we are not perfect. And there'll be things that are challenging us at the time. And then the next one is self-kindness. And people always think this is really soft and cushy. And I get that because there's the word, wording and our conception of that. But really, it's ba- basically, what can I give to myself right now, which will help me move in the right direction? You know, it's not all around, yeah, you'll see people on TV going, oh, give yourself a hug or go and hug someone. And that might be helpful for you in that moment. But for some of us, that's not. I'm not a huggy person. So just it's kind of around like more giving yourself something that you need. And that might be thinking about stress in a more balanced, balanced way. Like that, that could be an element of self-kindness. Or it, it might be actually going to seek support, talking to others, you know, especially around that common humanity again. Um, so self-kindness is very much individual and it's up to them it's like what do I need right now that would help me in this situation to move forward or to think more helpfully so being self-aware common humanity in essence recognizing that other people have these same thoughts these same inner experiences and then that self-kindness piece when it always makes me think of um, for example, having athletes focus on their strengths, recall their strengths, recall best moments, think about dream games, those kind of things, rather than continuing to dwell on what's going not, not so well, uh, which um, essentially bolsters the, the stress level. Yeah. And for, for you personally, Katie, it sounds like self-awareness was a big deal in your rowing career, but you're also a big fan of, uh, and I am too, that common humanity piece whereby Mm -hmm. if you know that other people are experiencing this everybody has this you know the best players in the world the best competitors in the world have these experiences that in and of itself can actually reduce your experiences your your debilitative feelings of stress yeah yeah and I also just quickly wanted to add that it also that thing of common humanity because I've noticed it when I work with my junior rowers and, you know, mm. even with some of the players, maybe within the intervention is that we have at that age, we have this thing of like, I'm going to compare myself to everyone else. And I'm going to compare myself to who I think is the best player in the room or the best rower in, rower in the room. And they have this godlike idea of this person that they're like, <laughs> you know, c- completely tough, gritty, everything like they, they don't let anything phase them. But actually, when you get them to do an activity like this, it's kind of that realization of, all oh, right so even actually the top player or the top rower thinks really similar to me and it kind of starts to break down that barrier of actually the way that I think is really quite human and maybe it kind of in a weird way allows them to kind of let go of that a bit more rather than being like why am I thinking like this this means I'm a really rubbish rower or only low level rowers think like this or low level footballers think like this I'm never going to make it when actually we're all kind of thinking the same. I agree, and this has been my experiences of the conversations I've had at the coalface, particularly with young participants in sport who are in talent development pathways. Mm-hmm. When they look up to the first team or they look up to senior competitors, um, they they think there's no way that players, uh, participants in the first team, you know, within senior um, competition, have the same thoughts, feelings, emotions as they do. But actually, once you help them understand that, these you know the best the best do you know then it makes such mm-hmm. a difference it's, it's a, it can make such a shift of uh of lens and subsequent mindset yeah no, that's right coming over to you paul let, let, let's just dwell on this idea of rebt now most people listening in will have heard my episodes we say um Dr. Martin Turner, who's a leading thinker in the field of REBT as applied to, to sport, rational emotive behavior therapy. And we're talking about intervening, interventions, coaching, coaching others, if you like. You utilize REBT, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and you mentioned Martin Turner. I mean, he was a big, big inspiration for me when I was on my master's at Staffordshire University. And it's been great to work with him since. And, um, You'll be able to see his fingerprints probably on some of this work. <laughs> and and so just unpack REBT for me just a, just a little bit. Just, just some basics here for those listening in. Yeah, I think it's, first of all, it's worth saying that 
It's really one of the sessions out of the six was focused on REBT specifically, okay. but um, this whole idea of ABC thinking, which I'll talk more about in a moment, that that permeated all, all of the sessions, absolutely. We were trying to give the young young athletes more controllability about how they responded to a situation. So very quickly with the with the ABC model, A stand in for adverse situation or activating event. You hear both of those terms used. B stand in for beliefs, and C stand in for consequences, which can be um, your thoughts, your emotions, or your behaviours. And what we wanted to get across to the athletes was that um, most people can think in an A to C way, missing out the B stage. So for instance, they hear um, the phrase exam and instantly start panicking about that. So that's the exam on its own governing their subsequent thoughts, feelings, behaviours and so on. And what we wanted to teach them is that if, if that was the case, then everybody would react the same way all the time to every situation. But that's not true. So what is it that causes people to react and think differently about situations? And in REBT, it's the beliefs stage, the B, that sits in between A and C. And in my shameless plug here, but in my 2021 paper, um, Stress Mindset in Athletes, I argued in that that if you have a stress is debilitating mindset, that is like a form of irrational beliefs because it is inflexible, illogical and unhelpful. Yeah. So we did work on some more um, football specific or swimming specific beliefs, but certainly by changing um, your stress mindset from debilitating to a more balanced view, we believe that that could help with subsequent events and, and situations because it's more rational, more flexible and more helpful. So for those coaches, those people listening in, coaching at the coalface, A, B, C, A can link to C without the B. Mm. So an activating event, I've got a swim meet coming up. The C, the consequence could be thoughts, emotions, behaviors that, um, you know, we can, ex we can experience stress. We can have stressful thoughts, stressful uh, feelings uh, and perhaps experience um, stress through our body and so we're going to behave in a particular a particular manner um, and a, a potential way to shift that is understanding there can be a B in between the A and C uh, one can uh, change their beliefs or engage in a process of beliefs that actually turns down the volume of uh, the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors that can debilitate uh, performance. We can have beliefs that are actually useful, that are facilitative. Am I hearing you correctly there, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. And I think it's worth saying at this stage as well that if there was one type of irrational belief that we probably focused on more than the others, and this really links into Katie's work, is this self-depreciation type of belief. So for instance, um, I must win my next match. And if I don't, that means that I'm a failure. And I think self-compassion is a really good way to help young people deal with those beliefs, which can, I guess, come automatically to them. You know, Katie's already mentioned that um, biologically, our brains are negatively skewed. So we yeah. wanted to give the young people a tool to challenge that. And I think that that probably starts with recognizing that they can challenge it. You know, the, the thoughts that you have, the, the beliefs that you have, you don't have to be lumbered with them for the rest of your life. And if you, if you work with uh, coaches or practitioners that help you shape your beliefs to being more rational, flexible, and so on, I think half the battle is recognizing that you can actually change those. So that was a big um, feature of our third session on the intervention. We, we used the term emotional responsibility and we really tried to plant this idea that, you know, it's up to you. You can't change the event often. You can't change the A, the activating event, the adversity. Yep. But what you have got some control over is your belief system in respect of that event.
Well, I can see the relationship between REBT, the ABC model, and self-compassion. For example, I'm playing at the weekend. It will be a disaster if I make mistakes. It will be the end of the world if I make mistakes. And so the consequence being a certain set of thoughts, emotions, and, and behaviors that then play out. Whereas I think to think uh, towards what Katie, how Katie, you are unpacking self-compassion, the the self-kindness, the common humanity and the mindfulness. I can immediately think of how coaches can use that common humanity around, you know, what look, even the best players in the world make mistakes. And then the self-kindness piece, if I do make a mistake, that's okay. That's a learning point, for for example. So there's a rationality to it and there's a self-kindness piece. So I can, Katie, I can absolutely see how self-compassion and REBT really, in many respects, can can fuse together and work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. We also use this um, Be Your Best Support Coach. Okay. So, like, rather than being your um, well, your your worst competitor, uh, or your biggest competitor, it was more around well, what can you actually say to yourself that will actually help you in that moment? And like, we're not talking about like let's just do positive thinking, think positive thoughts. Like, I know we know that doesn't work, and you know, <laughs> when I say that to adolescents, they're like, well, oh, it doesn't really work for me. So, you know, it, it was more around well, what's helpful at this moment to allow you to move forward in the in the right way and maybe that is acknowledging how you feel in that moment first I think that's always important there's no point going after um after you've lost going oh, I feel really happy about that you know that would that would be completely untruthful you know so it was kind of acknowledging that but then being like okay but now although you couldn't control the outcome of the event you couldn't control the whole of that outcome or what's happened now but you can now control maybe how you move forward and that's again an element of self-kindness like how am I how can I best move forward here now rather than just spend the whole time dwelling on it dwelling on it dwelling on it and getting into a bit of a a bit of a raft a little bit of this rumination kind of thing like how can I best move forward what would my support coach say to me now at this moment and that all came about from you know we had them think about what if your friend came to you with I am like I have failed I am a terrible person what would your friend actually say to you in that moment you know, in response to that. And they probably would say something, probably acknowledge it maybe, but, and then just kind of say something in response that was a lot more kinder. Um, So, yeah, so that's how we kind of got them to think a bit more of this self-kindness. It's interesting because I'm thinking here how this can be so applicable for coaches because you're using quite simple frameworks that obviously they have a complexity and a complication to them, of course. I don't think you can just simply use them out of the box, but these are are, are, are fairly, in some respects, straightforward frameworks that coaches can utilize to be able to help their their players, the participants in their coaching practice, to have, uh, to increase self-awareness, to have a more sophisticated relationship with thoughts, emotions, behaviors, to examine these in granular detail and then be able to flex and shift onto and using your word there Katie more helpful thoughts uh, emotions uh, and behaviors and and, you know there is an element always I think with these kind of things where you have to help young people and older people alike engage in some form of mental gymnastics don't you there's always going to be that but um, that's a skill I'm not formulating a question here um, guys but that 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 that's a skill that these these processes are are helping yeah absolutely and we won't be the first people to say this of course when working with athletes but we try to give the message at regular intervals during our work that these things that we're teaching you are actually skills and if you want to get the most out of them then you have to try and practice them Mm. and recognize that you might not instantly be able to be self-compassionate But at the same time, if you're prepared to stick with it and train like you would train in the gym, like you would train your technical skills, then it's something that you can improve and start to get more out of. And just quickly on the self-compassion, I think one of the highlights really and something that anybody can use when working with with young people 
we did a task on the intervention where we proved in inverted commas that if that if a friend came to them with a difficulty uh, we gave a scenario about falling out with a friend and they've unfollowed you on instagram um you would be able to give really helpful empathetic and supportive advice to that friend and everybody in the room always agreed that they would be able to be that friend so that that gave us like concrete evidence in their eyes that okay so you you have the capacity to do that to a friend therefore you have the capacity to do it to yourself and we never got any pushback about that everybody always agreed oh yeah it is within me i do have that that skill set i do have the ability to do that so our message was okay now we need to help you do that to yourself on a more frequent basis which can be tougher right because we're great at yeah. giving advice but when we're wrapped up in that emotion we're engulfed mm-hmm. in that emotion it's tough but that's where these skills come in exactly um, and we always gave that caveat when working with them you know you might find this difficult at first so yeah they have to be prepared to work at it and i guess you know our intervention was six weeks long and ideally beyond our stay we would hope that the coaches and the other players would be reinforcing some of these messages so that they become more more permanent within that club's culture. Six six times one hour over six weeks. Yeah, we're trialing it at the moment over in Portugal with um, individual sessions of half an hour twice a week. So getting all the sessions done in a in a three week spell. But yeah, what you'll read in our paper, it's pretty much one session a week one hour for six weeks so six weeks six hours of interventions or coaching if we can use that that term um hey take us through the results what uh, what did what did you both discover yeah so i guess what we expected um was that we could quite readily change somebody's stress mindset okay and the results uh, bore that out. You know, we had a we had a control condition, we had an experimental condition, around about forty eight, I think, in each. And compared to the control group, those in the intervention group were much more likely to see stress in a balanced way as a result of the work. So I wasn't overly surprised with that because a lot of other studies have shown that it can be changed in as little as three minutes, actually. But um, yeah, that was um, something that we were pleased to see because. Even though perhaps some of the other findings weren't quite as significant as what we wanted them to be, Mm. we know from the literature that over the course of time, if you have a more stress-enhancing mindset, the evidence is there that it is better for your well-being, your physical health, and research is starting to gather regarding performance as well. So that was something that that we found. Also, we were able to significantly reduce negative effect in the intervention group compared to those. Affect being feeling. Yeah, emotions, feelings, so things like anger, irritability. Uh, So we think that that changed as a result of stress mindset improving. So perhaps there's a knock-on effect. What was almost significant, and it was quite frustrating that it wasn't, was we measured clinical anxiety levels in the players and whilst um, the the female athletes experienced a a decrease of 15%, those in the experimental group, it wasn't quite enough to be significant. But to me, the way that the results were trending say that something was going on. So hopefully when we continue to, to measure this in subsequent iterations of the intervention, you know, we might start to see that come out. The other two things that we measured were irrational beliefs and perceived performance. Irrational beliefs reduced, but only by about 3%. And our conclusion from that is that we only had one of the six sessions targeted specifically on that. And we also believe that if this intervention was done on a one-to-one basis, that would allow you to really drill down into someone's specific irrational beliefs. So... I wanted it to change, obviously, but I wasn't overly surprised that there wasn't a significant change. 
And the last one, we, we took a measure of perceived performance. So we asked the players to rate from zero to 100. How well do you think you're playing at the beginning of the intervention and at the end? And although it trended in the right direction again, so the control group didn't really change, but the intervention group had, I think it was something like a 4% increase in perceived performance. Again, it wasn't significant. So we think that something might be going on, but perhaps it didn't come out as significant due to the way that we measured performance. And what we would like to do in the future is have some more objective measures of performance, maybe whether that's physiological data, sprint, um, maybe the coach rating the performance as well. So I've given quite a long-winded answer there, but I think those were the five strands that we measured in the in the paper. No, and I'll come back to those, but just coming over to you, Katie, any any thoughts, any considerations on those those results? I mean, yeah, they I suppose the one the one that didn't change irrational beliefs was a little bit disappointing. Um, but I think like the thing is with irrational beliefs, it's kind of like general irrational beliefs. And really, if you think about what we've spoke about over the past, you know, 45, 50 minutes, you know, it, we were really targeting their beliefs around stress. Yes. And, as you know, so it was really labored around, labored around that. So to to change general irrational beliefs may, may have been a bit, a, a little bit of a reach. But I also... You just made me reflect anyway, as I'm writing my discussion for my paper, was actually the, I suppose I talked about we are increasing their self-awareness. Now, I just wonder through increasing their self-awareness, is that actually increasing how much they're more aware of their rational beliefs than they were beforehand? Yes, we saw a reduction, but it wasn't a massive reduction. So I just don't know whether they're, it might have decreased, but they're more aware of those irrational beliefs that may be appearing. I don't know. It was just a little little assumption I've just kind of come up with then. But I think that that possibly, because as it is with all academic research, we have to think about, or why didn't we find a, a finding that we wanted to find? We have to come up with a kind of an explanation to that. And um, I just wonder whether, although it was good to have more self-awareness, obviously, were they just more self-aware of their rational beliefs? Paul, any thoughts on Katie's thought experiment there? <laughs> I love Katie's thought experiment. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very valid suggestion. And I think to add to that as well, not everybody had irrational beliefs to change. So I don't know the figures from the top of my head, but I remember looking at them thinking that specifically for some of the irrational beliefs, the mean scores weren't that high in the first place. So that's why I think maybe having an intervention where it's targeted Perhaps you screen people for irrational beliefs at the start and then select the ones that that maybe possess the higher irrational beliefs. I think you'd get more success w- with that kind of approach, to be honest. But a really interesting um, kind of dynamic is this idea of demandingness. So we're having a few battles at the moment with some athletes that think that by adopting this, I have to win, I must win type approach they're pushing back against us because they they're saying well actually we think that's helpful we think that's motivational but we're having some interesting discussions about trying to trying to alter that uh, belief system at the moment can you share with us what kind of things what rationale do they have for that belief that i must win i have to play well is actually those kind of thoughts are an aid to their performance. Are, are you able to share their their sort of rationale, their explanation? Yeah. Um, so I guess what the athletes tell us is they think that's motivational. Okay. And it's just part of the fabric of sport at higher levels. Yep. So the coach, in a well-meaning way, might often say that, you know, you have to win today, guys. You absolutely have to win you see it as headlines on the news, on social media. But how we kind of challenge them is a few ways. First of all, our our one get out with all of this is that study after study, one of my own included, Martin Turner's work and so on, shows that when you possess high demandingness beliefs that is strongly associated with worse psychological well-being, 
it's not just one study, it's numerous studies. So that's that's something that nobody can can get away from. And then the other thing that we that we try and use is that at times there might be some utility in thinking that as a short term solution. So if you're on mile 24 of the marathon and you start saying to yourself, I have to get to the end, I must get to mile 26. We're saying that in those short term doses that actually can have some use for you but over a long-term um, situation if you're saying this to yourself all the time it can really have a detrimental impact on your well-being and I guess my last point really is that when they say it's motivational our pushback is that motivation is not just about being high and low it's about quality of motivation as well and often if you've got this must win, have to type mentality, maybe you're not doing it for yourself. And I'm sure that others will be able to point out that when your motivation is perhaps a bit more extrinsic, it's not going to be as helpful for you in the long run in terms of your performance and your well-being. So we're having some interesting discussions and uh, we'll continue to have them, I'm sure, over the next few iterations of the project. I do also think like, some of the these irrational beliefs and this I must win is also coming a little bit from their environment around them now I'm not a social psychologist but if you think about it like some of the maybe the team talks and things you know there is probably some of this you know you must win or this is a must win game I mean that was something that came out Paul with our podcast the other day you know with a coach saying this is a must win game so ultimately you're already going to have that belief of ah oh, I, I must win because I need to win for my team it's also, I suppose, you know, from doing the studies within the educational setting as well. You know, the educational setting is kind of very much set up for this. You know, you must get this grade to be able to go and carry on with university and everything else. You know, there's always kind of these boundaries, these stipulations of you must do this to get to this. So I think like sometimes I would just feel like our climate is very much gearing us towards having some of these demandingness beliefs. Um, so I think sometimes I think that's what I think me and Paul are probably going to look for in the bit in the future is actually changing some of the climate around and changing the language such as around stress but also around some of these irrational beliefs and then letting them kind of run the intervention with the athletes with the students etc because that way you're kind of you're killing two birds with one stone aren't you you're sorting out the the climate and then that is going to be repeated 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 because I suppose we've got the argument now is when we go to follow up so we're doing this current study where we're going to have follow-up. Now, I'd hope that there will be change because I'm hoping that we've changed their mindset, which is their ingrained beliefs. But there is a problem with the fact that the environment is going to be very much against what, we, what we've been saying. So it might undo some of that. I love it. And I love what both of you have said because my work at the Coalface, it's so, so relevant and, you know, to speak to your point, Katie, to, to, to start with, context is king and the environment around these players, the, the, the socio, socio-cultural uh, pressure on them, uh, the use of language, the, um, the environment is going to make a huge difference. It, you mentioned this term climate, the motivational climate. Um, is going to make a difference whether it's ego oriented so we need to beat others we must win we mm-hmm. must must demonstrate superior skill over others and and, and 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 play better than them and win tends to the the volume of that tends to turn up whereas having that task orientation tend the volume of that tends to tends to be uh, turned down um, so I think I think you're 100 percent correct is that mm-hmm. these players tend to be socialized if they're in if they have ambitions and they're in a in a high performance program especially they tend to be socialized into must win must win must perform must perform because that's seen perhaps as an advantageous set of communication tools mm-hmm. f- uh, from coaches um so I, I think that's so relevant I, I i think what's really interesting i mean in in my own work where i tend to and I've had some interesting conversations with Dr. Martin Turner on this, and I'm not 100% sure whether we agree or disagree or part agree, but um, I think must win, must perform can tend to be disastrous at the highest level of, of sport. 
it evokes stress, it evokes anxiety, and across all sport, it, it so often not just leads to ill being, as you've mentioned there, Paul, it so often leads to, to failure in individual sports, in team sports. And where I find quite a great deal of, of success in my own work, I find, is actually if a player, if a person is insistent on having extreme language, it's to try to direct that extreme language onto aspects of performance that are more controllable, if you like. Because because then if it's, well, I must make those runs, or I must uh, execute the responsibilities in my role, or I, I must keep great body language, at least then, at least then those factors are more controllable. And, and much more achievable and, and so I do tend to find in my own work it's like it's if somebody is really insistent on having uh, have to's and must it's like, okay but can we at least make those things as controllable as possible yeah and we had like one part of the intervention I suppose kind of hones into that a little bit I suppose I didn't think of it like that but we got them to write down like what is the type of person they want to be in the face of stress so I suppose that could be like I, I must still show that I am a determined person or I must still show effort as a person. So it's kind of look at their, their values and those could be things that they could control and they could still convey in those in those situations. Um, so, yeah, we, I suppose we started to bring, maybe that's a bit of ACT there, but we started to bring some of the, val- the, the value-driven behaviour because they are elements that you can control and you, and you could try and show. Paul, anything? Yeah, and I guess another thing that I'm going to start to use on reflection in our applied work with the problem with musts and have tos is they're often accompanied by a secondary irrational belief. So, for instance, I absolutely have to win today is often accompanied by, and if I don't, it means that I'm a failure, or and if I, and if I don't, I couldn't stand it. So that's another reason that I want to try and get you know the young people that we work with to operate in more of a preferences kind of way rather than this abs- absolutistic way of thinking in a, in a black and white have to or it's the end of the world type scenario so that's another reason that we try to try to encourage them to think I really want to win today and I'll do all that I can to to achieve that but if I don't it might be bad but I can tolerate it and I can bounce back and I can learn from it. And we think that's just a a more flexible uh, way of, of dealing with that. And you've used the phrase a couple of times down in the podcast about turning down the volume of anxiety. And that's something that we use as well. And I totally um, value that. And I think so do the people that we're working with that it's not going to take your Um, nerves or anxiety or stress away it's not going to do that but is it going to turn down the volume of the pressure that you put upon yourself I'd like to think it would yeah and look you can go to the extreme length again I'm going to speak from my own experiences and certainly not empiricized but uh, I find one of the most effective places to help athletes go who are serious about their game perhaps they're competing at the professional level is to actually not care at all about their performance or the outcome to go completely the other way but just to select a a, a set of processes or cues if you like that they are going to care about Uh, uh, but they're going to be carefree around outcome and performance but uh we, I could talk all day about that dynamic. I think it's really, really, it's really, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. I'm carefree about how I perform, but uh, I'm really focused on the processes that I want to engage in. I think it's a, is a healthy place to reside. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can't thank you both enough for coming on to the show and, and discussing this really, really fascinating line of research. Uh, and I know you will have both tapped the interest of those listening in. So coming to you first, Katie, how can people find you, follow you and and, and get in touch? Uh, yeah, you can get in touch with me on Twitter, um, which is at Sparks. So S-P-A-R-K-S and then S-C-I and then 7014 is is my twitter handle if that doesn't work uh linkedin you find katie sparks lecturer at staffordshire university sport and exercise psychology you'll find that as well perfect and and coming over to you paul yeah probably in an academic sense linkedin is the best way to to get hold of me i am on 
Twitter is at Paul Mansell 10. I guess I use that predominantly for my um, football related work. I'm involved in a Wolves podcast as well. Um, we're happy to engage with people about the work, either on Twitter or LinkedIn. Well, I can't thank you both enough. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me. Well, everyone, I really enjoyed that podcast and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via X, formerly Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com to tell me what you think of the Sports Hut Show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.